Welcome everyone watching. Uh, this is the SARA 2020 Global Congress in virtual format. Uh, I'm Rob Quinn, the Executive Director of Scholars at Risk. Uh, and the title for this, our closing plenary session, is a conversation with President Ronald J. Daniels, Johns Hopkins University, and Dr. Jonathan Cole, Columbia University. Um, our standard housekeeping for those who have been with us during the day, we invite you to use the Q&A function at the bottom of your Zoom screen uh, to send in any questions uh, during the session uh, so our speakers can, can peruse them and try to bring them in. Apologies if we can't bring in all the questions due to time. We also encourage you to share your questions, favorite quotes, comments uh, via social media on Twitter, Facebook, and LinkedIn using the hashtags um, at Scholars at Risk or the hashtag, hashtag SAR Congress 2020. Um, for those who are unable to attend all the sessions, we are recording them and they'll be made available later. And a reminder again, mark your calendars. We hope to reschedule some in-person elements November 16th and 20th, uh, 2020 in New York City. So um, as I said at the start of the day, um, even in normal times, our work at Scholars at Risk uh, is about resilience. And all of you are part of that. We exist to assist colleagues to overcome pressures and threats. We exist to document attacks on the higher education space. We exist to preserve and promote the values of that space, values that are important not only to higher education, but to everyone in society. And the resilience at the heart of our network is now on display as we join together in this virtual format. I want to especially recognize President Daniels and his fantastic staff at Johns Hopkins. From the mo first moment we reached out about the possibility of bringing the SAR 2020 Congress uh, to their university, everyone from President on Daniels down was extraordinarily welcoming and supportive. They got it as to why our work together to help colleagues and defend universities matters. And they worked with us and went out of their way in so many ways to enable us to offer a fabulous program on their beautiful campus. Of course, among our regrets of the times is that we aren't gathering in person in Baltimore today, but we are fortunate and grateful to be welcoming President Daniels to the Congress and the Congress to Johns Hopkins, at least in this virtual sense. I also want to recognize our extremely equally fabulous partners at the AAAS in Washington, D.C., who similarly work diligently and generously to host student advocacy days, workshops. We hope to be able to work with them on those in the future. And of course, thanks to all our Congress co-sponsors and all the funding partners listed in the Congress program and all our network members and partners and all of you who make scholars at risk and our collective work possible. Uh, now, without further delay, let me introduce my friend, colleague and scholars at risk board chair, NYU professor Catherine Stimson, introduce our two discussants. Kate, take uh, it away. Thank you, Rob. I would like first to continue the theme of gratitude. And I think we all wish to express our gratitude to the first responders in this global crisis, to the doctors, the nurses, the emergency technicians, the dentists, the people who are scrubbing the hospital floors and the ambulance floors, our thanks. Next, Rob, to you and the SAR staff, for your extraordinary preparation from taking us from reality to virtuality. It took a lot of work. Thank you for doing that work. Next gratitude to all the supporters of Scholars at Risk, our network, including our International Advisory Committee. And finally, and not least, gratitude to our Scholars at Risk and to all the righteous warriors, sung and unsung, who are defending the values we all treasure. It's now actually, it's my pleasure, my honor, to introduce two righteous warriors. One of them, well, his full name is Ronald J. Daniels. A lot of people just call him Ron. The 14th president of Johns Hopkins, one of the great historic universities in the United States and elsewhere. And President Daniels, so many of us count on and rely on the Johns Hopkins website about the coronavirus. It is reliable, 
it is up to date, it is invaluable, not only for keeping our culture together, it's invaluable to show the so often demeaned values of science. Your record, what you've done at Johns Hopkins so far is amazing in terms of giving more students access, in terms of your model engagement with the city of Baltimore, your support of economic and social innovation. Now, I'm very loyal to my home institution, but I envy faculty members at Johns Hopkins. You are a law and economics scholar. You're the author or co-author of seven books and uh, dozens of scholarly articles. Thank you for being there. And thank you for making the journey from Canada in the north, south to Baltimore, from Toronto to Johns Hopkins, to do all that you have done. My next great pleasure is to introduce my old friend, Jonathan R. Cole. And I'm going to call you John. And John is the John Mitchell Mason Professor at Columbia. John was for 14 years the provost and the dean of faculties at Columbia, the second longest tenure as provost in the university's proud 258 year history. What you've given scholarship, you've helped to develop, been fundamental in the development of the sociology of science. You have written one of the major indispensable books about the American research universities. You have been a staunch advocate of and explorer of academic freedom. Your forthcoming volume is Who's Afraid of Academic Freedom, which will be coming out from Columbia University Press soon. And you hold degrees from Columbia College and Columbia University. It's sometimes said of John Cole, Jonathan R. Cole, that he bleeds Columbia blue. Thank heavens he is there because what he has done for scholarship matters to all of us. He's not only a friend, he's an indispensable member of the board of Scholars at Risk. President Daniels, Professor Cole, thank you for the dialogue that will illuminate us all Thank you for sharing virtual space with us. President Daniels, Professor Cole, John, take it away. The screen is over to the two of you, Warriors for Righteousness and Universities. Well, uh, uh, thank you very much. Uh, I, um, it's a great, great pleasure to be here and to be part of this Congress, even if it's in virtual uh, form, but it's even a greater pleasure for me to have the opportunity to ask some questions and maybe um, add a few comments myself uh, to uh, be in dialogue with one of the really handful of, of greatest presidents uh, of uh, major universities that we have throughout the world. And, <clears throat> and that's Ron Daniels. I can't tell you uh, the extraordinary job that he has done. Uh, this is, after all, Johns Hopkins is, after all, the real first major research university uh, in the United States, uh, born in uh, 1876 with a great, great tradition. And under the leadership, and I mean real leadership, of uh, Ron, this uh, university is thriving. And as you suggest, Kate, uh, in this particular time, it is playing an enormous role. So uh, without ado, let me, let me ask Ron uh, uh, a question or two. Uh, let him take off, uh, since I think he's in the sort of middle of the war and I'm on the periphery. And uh, then I'll uh, enter my two cents worth in um, as, uh, as a go forward. Uh, but again, thanks. Uh, Ron, it's, a goal. it's always good to see you. It's always good to be part of any discussion with you. But, um, you know, you're, you're in the middle of this, um, this, this uh, storm in a way. I mean, 
you have a campus community um, that has had a long tradition. It's, uh, it acts in a certain way with certain values. And it's been interrupted in a sort of unique way, a unique way for our students, faculty, staff, and I dare say even the leadership of the university. Could you tell us a little bit about how the uh, campus community is doing and some of the things that you have, uh, steps that you've had to do to not only preserve the community, but to, um, to really uh, lead the students and faculty as well. Thanks, uh, Jonathan. And I, I just uh, want to first and foremost uh, thank uh, Rob for the opportunity to participate in this session. Uh, Professor Stimson, thank you for that all too generous introduction. And Jonathan, of course, uh, it's wonderful to have the opportunity to be in conversation with you. As Rob indicated, we're really heartbroken uh, that we're not able to host uh, this uh, conference in person and really do hope that um, in the years to come we'll have another opportunity because I have such enormous respect for the organization, the core values that it um, embodies, the work that you've done on behalf of scholars throughout the world to really affirm their role in independence and, uh, and really be at the vanguard of uh, the great cause of academic freedom. So for all these reasons, um, this is such an important um, a Congress and, and moment, and uh, though we're disappointed that we can't host this in person, I'm, I'm really glad to be able to be in conversation with you all today. Uh, Jonathan, you asked, um, how, does, how are we doing here at Hopkins? How have we made the transition? In some sense, we're like uh, virtually every other major research university in the United States, and uh, of course, uh, uh, liberal arts colleges and other institutions of higher education, and that we have made this quite remarkable transition to um, virtual space in an, a number of the dimensions of our traditional mission. So um, we have transitioned quickly, remarkably quickly in fact, but from a, a vibrant uh, campus with uh, undergraduates and graduates, students and faculty, staff mingling um, in classrooms outside to a world in which I'm still on campus, but um, there are very few people that are here uh, still with me. And um, we have, in the case of our education program, transitioned to online instruction in the way that was described in the last panel. Um, and I, you know, I think it, in truth, really does have a makeshift quality. But you know, it is remarkable. I'm talking to several of my uh, academic colleagues here. Um, how how seamless this transition has been. We were really worried about it, but um, this was our first week in instruction and a few days in, we've had very few hiccups in terms of our uh, ability to continue to offer um, instruction to our undergraduates and graduate students. So we've made the move on that dimension, obviously on the research side, particularly for a place like Hopkins where we have a very significant um, lab-based research enterprise. Um, we've had to dramatically curtail that uh, research enterprise. And again, a very significant transition as we have put so much of the research activity that normally takes place in our labs um, in, um, in a state of suspension. Uh, we have, of course, uh, made exception for uh, faculty and uh, graduate students or postdocs who are doing work around COVID and also tried to be sensitive to those uh, scientists who are conducting experiments that have gone on for several months and didn't want them to reduce their um, uh, activity in a way that would jeopardize months of work. But, but it is a very different enterprise and, ha and that transition was, aff uh, was affected remarkably quickly. So the campus in many ways is, is uh, remarkably different and has transitioned where we can to virtual space. And for those faculty who are able in the humanities and social sciences to conduct their research without having to be dependent on labs, uh, we uh, are assured that that is still continuing. Um, what I would say though, as much as it has changed, there's some things that um, are really remarkably similar to the world that we were in just a few weeks ago. And here, um, uh, already there was allusions to the role that our public health uh, colleagues and, and colleagues from the School of Medicine and nursing 
have been playing in terms of the um, information, perspective, analysis, facts that they're bringing to the public square. And so that's a vital role for the university and our colleagues have been really stepping up in quite remarkable ways to basically um, provide independent factual information that is of course one of the key missions of the research university and also of course uh, to speak truth to power where the uh, ideas, perspectives of science differ from that of uh, political leaders. Our colleagues have been continuing to do that. And again, in the context of the pandemic, this role has never been more important. You know, well, I think that's uh, interesting. And as, as far as I can see, uh, Hopkins has made all the right uh, calls and uh, it seems to be resonating and uh, accepted by your faculty and students. Uh, let me ask you a question. Um, since Hopkins, it seems to me, is in the news every day, people do rely on it for information, for, for truth, for accurate information uh, from your school of public health, from your school of, uh, of medicine. Um, you know, this is such a contrast from the idea that was put forth in the Calvin Committee report that no one speaks for the university, um, that it's a collection of individuals when one has to make the decision of making a drawing a line and saying, well, this research is essential or this research is not essential or uh, this activity is essential, this is not. Um, is that being defined in terms of the institutional values or are you having to sort of uh, develop a new set of values or a new set of parameters given the seriousness of the pandemic? So, Jonathan, um, you know, if we start off with, again, like any university, uh, the university builds on the primacy of the individual and the individual uh, scientist, uh, scholar. And so, um, you know, here we've got, again, a remarkable constellation of people who have um, expertise in all facets of the pandemic. And so, you know, first and foremost, you know, through the traditional screen processes we use as to who gets appointed, the nature of the, their relationship to the university, you have confidence that, you know, the normal work of the university has essentially certified the expertise of those folks. And, you know, the, the uh, first and foremost goal is to make sure that they have an appropriate platform to speak um, authoritatively in their areas of expertise. And, you know, on top of that, then you start to see in moments like this, what are the opportunities where the university can think about um, uh, bringing together those colleagues around uh, uh, these common uh, challenges that we're facing now and, and trying to create a sense of shared enterprise. So, you know, we are in the midst of um, putting forward a significant amount of um, uh, emergency funding to stand up a host of different uh, research projects that uh, will have immediate impact on COVID. And again, um, we've started the conversation and you're encouraging interdisciplinary collaboration the way that we do with so many other things we do at the university. But it's remarkable how quickly our faculty have responded and the, um, the ways in which the, the, the great common work of the university is is naturally exhibiting itself even in this uh, circumstance. Well, that's uh, extremely interesting. I, I want to follow up and ask, um, has this uh, event, which is, uh, of course, um, we think of it as unique, but it may be just the first of many such events um, because of the nature of viruses and, um, <coughs> and bacteria uh, as a new enemy, as it were. Uh, does it tell you something as far as you're concerned about the relationship between science and um, uh, public health and, and government and, uh, and how we, we connect in a better way and form in a better way and produce in a better way uh, the science that uh, the public can actually trust and translate that hopefully into either legislation or actions by governors, by mayors, by uh, the federal government uh, in the future. 
so Jonathan, uh, it's a great question. And I know you'll have some views on this as well. So, um, you know, I, th I think this represents a tremendously important opportunity for us to um, be very self-conscious about our capacity to um, bring enlightenment values, um, bring uh, the force of reason, bring principle uh, facts into the public square, and to first and foremost ensure that we are discharging the traditional role that we in the academy play in terms of uh, discovering, interrogating, and ultimately validating truth. And so here, you know, on something like uh, the pandemic, it, um, it is something that, you know, that um, like other disruptions, other challenges, other grave crises that we faced in the past, um, it has, I think, called forth a whole host of uh, different sources of expertise in the university where you know we have a responsibility to speak uh, to the public. And I think to your point, to do so in a way that's accessible and also has the capacity to uh, help shape government uh, priorities. So, you know, again, what's been really interesting is you know, to see, for instance, our school, our, our colleagues from the School of Public Health who are um, now um, in a collaboration with uh, Harvard's Kennedy School and with Bloomberg Philanthropies are basically um, meeting weekly uh, in virtual format with um, uh, mayors from across the country who are very much on the front lines of how they grapple with this crisis. And here it's an opportunity to really model this sort of um, uh, relationship that is truly a two-way street that you are able to draw on um, principle and theory and epidemiological data and so forth that we're um, immersed in, but at the same time test that on the crucible of experience and working hand in hand with uh, mayors to um, ensure that there's better uh, delivery of the kinds of um, services that are needed to be able to flatten the curve of this crisis. So I, I think there's multiple uh, avenues uh, that are uh, that uh, are open to us now. And again, you know, what's really remarkable for me, Jonathan, and something that you and I have talked about in the past, to the extent that over the last several years, if not longer, we've been uh, seeing this um, challenge to the academy and to the ideas of expertise and to whether they really have cogency or not in contemporary society or, you know, everything's up for grabs and there are no... Uh, True, true facts. I think actually we're seeing instinctively people moving in remarkable ways back to looking to research universities and to the academy to provide guidance. Just one little interesting factoid that I'll share. The American Association of Universities, uh, which basically has about 65 uh, uh, research universities, half public and private, approximately as members, but they do regular survey work. And what's really interesting is now seeing that the percentage of the public that has greater confidence in research universities than actually in the uh, federal government for advice on um, public health issues like those raised by the pandemic is uh, significantly higher. It's about 79% who will look first to research universities versus 62% who will trust the federal government. That's a remarkable change from where we've been in a relatively short period of time. Yeah, well, I, I, I think that's, uh, that's actually very good news. Um, I sometimes wonder whether or not uh, we are the worst advertisers for ourselves, the research universities, and that um, despite the fact that, um, you know, places like Hopkins are getting uh, a tremendous amount of, I think, uh, um, play as it were in the in the media especially in certain cable networks um we don't we don't make the very very explicit point of how important and critical these uh, research universities really are not only for the transmission of knowledge to our students but for the future of welfare of the nation and how much of the economics of the nation is dependent upon in fact, what we do at these research universities, we allow that to be inferred by the public rather than to be explicit 
about it uh, in, in, in a very open uh, and proud way. I, you know, again, Jonathan, this is something that you have um, been, I think, perhaps one of the uh, most, if not the most articulate uh, champion for the idea of the research university in contemporary society. And um, I agree with you. You know, we, 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 we um, have a vital, indeed, I would argue, indispensable role to play in um, modern society. And we, in fact, are playing that role in so many different dimensions. But it takes a crisis sometimes for people to realize the institutions that really matter and um, can contribute in a very material way to uh, societal welfare. So you're right. There's so many ways in which uh, the work, the good work of the research university can be traced to um, a host of different uh, economic success stories uh, that we see throughout the world. But right now in the midst of a crisis, you know, if we're uh, going to think about where the best public health practices come from or how we actually understand the nature of the virus and whether one can concoct quickly an effective vaccine or other kinds of interventions that will deal with patients who are grappling with uh, the illness in florid state. People can look to research universities, not surprisingly. They are looking to research universities. And, um, and in some sense, this just provides powerful affirmation of how important we really are. Uh, Ron, I want to shift just a little bit. Um... I consider uh, Hopkins, along with a variety of other institutions, many of them AAU uh, membership institutions, some beyond AAU uh, in the United States, to be truly international universities. Uh, and this is an international conference. Um, and the knowledge that you are generating and the things that you are generating speak in some ways to um, what is going on around the world. And I was wondering if you had anything at this point to say to people who are students who are watching or faculty who are watching about the interconnectedness that um, is part of all this and, um, and how the research universities can become more of a true network. So I think, Jonathan, there's just ample opportunity for us, even discovering both the strengths and limitations of these virtual connectivity, but for us to deepen the ties to um, institutions throughout the world. And look, you know, again, if we go back to that um, uh, uh, map, the coronavirus map that uh, was birthed, and I should say again, um, you know, the power of the individual within a university, but it's basically a young faculty member in the School of Engineering, in the Whiting School of Engineering, Lauren Gardner, who created this site that um, started off because she had graduate students from China who were really interested in tracking the spread of the virus uh, in China. And that caused her to think about the creation of this map that in turn, of course, has become the centerpiece of, of so many different organizations, institutions that are really tracking uh, the nature of the spread of this virus. But there's something very powerful as one watched the movement of the virus and could see uh, the um, infection rate and see the mortality rate and the recovery rate. But it was a, a very powerful way as it hopped across uh, oceans and touch continents and now here very much with us in the United States. But in some sense, it's kind of underscored our common humanity. We face this crisis together. And I think it's brought together our collective um, search for truth and solutions and best practices. And you know, it's just my hope that the kind of networks and the collaborations that are being birthed in this moment will ultimately endure beyond this. I should say just again, um, as an example of this, one of the lessons that was, uh, that um, one of our colleagues has taken from the great flu pandemic of 1918 is to look at the possibility of um, developing serum, which was used in 1918 as a way of uh, getting antibodies from people who've recovered then from the flu and using, uh, using that to help people who are um, uh, very ill with the disease currently. And so that, 
that idea is one that is now being pursued on multiple sites, on multiple contents, continents. Um, and again, I think just underscores um, that we're all in this together. And, um, and, uh, and, I, and I again hope and, and indeed feel confident that one of the things that will come from this in terms of legacy is that the muscles that we've developed in this moment will endure. <clears throat> well, I think it, it, that's very well put. Um, I must say that one of the things that has come forward to, uh, to me, and we don't have very much more time, is the power in a, in a way of the humanities and the arts during all of this, and uh, what our faculties can contribute and our, and our students uh, can tr contribute, the young people, who um, if you, you know, occasionally watch YouTube and things like that, um, you see songs of, uh, that are being done virtually, but throughout the world by young people and some older people, old, old folks like Ringo Starr and the like. But it, is, uh, it puts a smile on one's face and uh, you have links now to the arts, to, the, to music, to various other kinds of things. And it shows how humanistic as well our institutions are and that the it's not just science, it's the combination of science and the humanities and engineering, as you say, uh, and the hospitals and the people who are putting their lives on the line at Hopkins Hospital that make this into a, a, a perhaps different kind of community, but one in which there is still possibility to take joy in that community. I, I, I think you've said it very eloquently, Jonathan, and uh, I um, wholeheartedly uh, endorse that uh, view. I don't well, I'm, I'm sorry to cut in here, but I'm afraid that is all the time we have. Uh, Jonathan and Ron, thank you so much for sharing with us. Uh, I think that last point reminding us that this is really across every single discipline because this touches people in every single way they live, uh, and that's where the university lives. And, and as Ron, as you said, we're all in this together. Um, so if I could ask all of our uh, attendees, thank you for spending this time with us. If you could, in your own ways, thank our speakers. Uh, Ron, thank you, and everyone at Johns Hopkins again. We wish you all success in dealing with this on your campus and your community as we go forward. Uh, Jonathan, thank you, and to everyone in the Columbia community. And again, thank you, everybody, for watching us throughout this first day of our 2020 Global Congress in virtual format. I hope you found it interesting. I did. I hope you found it even a bit fun. Uh, we're all getting better at this. Special thanks to those who shared uh, Q&As using the Zoom function or shared comments during the, through the social media platforms. Um, if you'll allow me, we will resume tomorrow, Friday, March 27th, for the second and final day of the Virtual Congress. We will begin at 10.30 a.m. Eastern Time in the United States, 3.30 p.m. Central European Time, going to have four sessions again tomorrow, as we did today, starting with a really interesting session on the Middle East. We'll start with a session on uh, concerns in Sub-Saharan Africa. That's a region where historically up to a third of SAR cases, scholars originate. It's a very important region for these issues. We'll then have a very exciting plenary session at 11.30 Eastern Time, 4.30 Central European Time, featuring the launch of a brand new, first time ever global academic freedom index. Uh, this would be a milestone event giving us a new tool to protect academic freedom. Uh, then at noon uh, Eastern Time, 5 p.m. Central Europe, we'll have a panel on teaching academic freedom, which is in very many ways uh, a continuation of the conversation about academic freedom and civil discourse on our campuses that we had today. And then finally, we will conclude tomorrow as we did today with a plenary conversation in this case, featuring President Paula Johnson of Wellesley College, a discussion with Dr. Hari Han of the SNF Agora Institute at Johns Hopkins. So we look forward to connecting with all of you again tomorrow. Thank you all for taking part in this important event today. And I wish you all a good afternoon, a good morning, or a good evening. Thank you.